Okay, well, thank you very much. So, so about I don't know five years ago, I had a birthday conference, and um, you know, at the dinner, you you sort of sort of spend a certain amount of time thanking all sorts of people, and amongst other things, it was finally time to say something nice to John. And so, just as I was getting around to John, he gets up and goes and takes a phone call. So, you know, all that niceness was wasted. So, I I I, I, uh, I should uh, maybe repeat myself and uh, just say what it. it uh, Wonderful thing it's it's been over the years to have a, have a John as both a friend and, and collaborator is it's a, it's a very probably one of the more difficult things for sort of steps in a career is is this business when you just after your doctorate when you're sort of stopping working on a problem that's been given to you and, and developing your own research and having a a sort of a wise elder brother around is uh, is just been marvelous so thank you. And of course, you know, little brothers, of course, being rather sort of uh, disobedient and uh, annoying. Um, he's also been very good at, uh, over the years of uh, tolerating my quirks. Um, so it's it's fitting that we're going to be talking going to be talking about um, something that's uh, joint with with Semyon uh, and. Uh, so, so, so the question basically is understanding uh, for the other sort of classical groups, um, which you know come in an infinite series and therefore can be completed to some sort of big infinite dimensional thing, the analogous uh, things of of KP flows in the uh, sort of A series, that's sort of GLN, in a, in a geometric context. Now, it's it's there's with these these uh, generalizations which get named bkp and ckp and so on it's clear that the people who you know were wrote them down had a some sort of notion of how it was linked to uh you know orthogonal or symplectic groups um but it's it was a very interesting exercise to make the i mean people like johan and, and uh, well kritchever um but it's nice to sort of sit down and, and make it make the link explicit. So maybe I'll just start by saying what I'm going to make explicit by sort of reminding you for for KP uh, the setup. Um, so the first thing is you have a, a Hilbert space, which um, splits into two pieces, sort of positive frequency. And negative frequency. So this is power series and Z and or Laurent series, and you've got positive and negative bits. Um, and you have a a uh, a Grassmann manifold. This is Alasigo and Wilson, um, which is the set of subspaces um, commensurable with um, H plus. Um, so, in other words, the projection onto the positive piece is going to be a Fredholm operator and index. You recognize the question? Hello? Oh, hi, Stephen. Um, so, uh, it's a Fredholm, and I'm just going to fix index to be zero. Um, the negative one, the pi minus is, I'll just say small. Uh, so it can be Hilbert Schmidt or trace class or whatever. Um, and um, the other actor in this game is a group gamma, which is an infinite dimensional abelian group. And it is just the um, set of these exponential quantities um so the exponential of some ti the ti's are parameters z is is another parameter so t uh, sub i belong to c and uh, z belongs to c and it acts it'll act by multiplication on h on elements of h and so uh, on the Grassmannian, 
And uh, sort of a final widget is the, the determinant bundle, which really you want to think of its dual instead over the Grassmannian. So you've got a plane and you take its top exterior power. Now, of course, this is infinite dimensional, so it's a little bit tricky, but you can do it. Um, so it's got a section sigma, which is non-zero precisely over the set of things that are projected isomorphically to H. So when, when the, the projection ceases to be an isomorphism, this, this section vanishes. Big cell. In other words, known as the big cell. Um, and um, the, you can build a tau function. I'll put gamma. Uh, do I want gamma? Maybe not. Um, tau of GT basically takes this section, normalizes it in a way that I uh, don't want to go into. And um, so the Grassmannian is a homogeneous space. You act on it by a, a group of element of this GL infinity. And uh, you act then on, on uh, this thing with this, this abelian group. And you get a function that depends on T and G is sort of the initial value of this thing. And I'll just put normalized here. Okay, so that's the, the, the infinite dimensional setup. Uh, maybe just mention algebraically one of the, the if you want, quasi-periodic um, solutions to the, the KP uh, hierarchy. You basically, you've got a Riemann surface. Uh, you've got a sort of baseline bundle. Uh, you're tensoring it with LT. You're basically just taking this gamma here and using it as a transition function in a sort of clever way. And, um, and you're allowing at some point an arbitrary order of poles. And that's the, the, uh, the algebraic solutions. Um, that you then evaluate the, the tau function uh, on the flow, the flow here gets manifested by this this T. So I'm just mentioning it because it's there's a um, <clears throat> a uh, a CKP version. The other thing is in in uh, in finite dimensions, which is sort of the the uh, the model uh, for this thing, um, all of this stuff. So if you take the uh, the Grassmannian of GKN, K planes and N space, uh, you have a sort of natural sort of affine coordinate. So this is the equivalent of the big cell um, where you represent an element of the Grassmannian, you normalize, um, so you've got a K by N vector and the, the entries of this uh, so you normalize here in the A. If you could just use a parametrization, which is, is sort of has great redundancy, which is just to put a, a K by N matrix and take its columns and think of these as, as generating a plane. Okay, so the, the columns have to be independent. They'll generate a plane. Obviously, there's a whole sort of freedom here in choosing, you know, it's choosing a basis in a plane. Um, so you, in, on this big cell, you normalize a piece to be the, the identity matrix. Okay. Um, the other thing that's a sort of major player in this thing is you have Plucker coordinates. So the, the, uh, Grassmannian of K and gets embedded into the projectivization of the k exterior power of CN. And you just take a basis. Here, take its its top exterior power of the of, of the of a plane, and associate to that its its exterior power. Uh, these things don't don't uh, come for for free. So you you'll get, in other words, a, uh, a so if I take an element here and and forget the the projective factor, I can just represent it as um, a uh, a sum of EI was B, EI one wedge EI K. 
and these are the associated coordinates. Um, so these, these I'll just call the, the uh, actually I use pi here, shouldn't I? I'm gonna be consistent. Um, and uh, <clears throat> a sort of key, key player in what I'm gonna be talking about is these things come with a set of quadratic relations. In other words, if you're in this, this exterior product, an element doesn't necessarily represent a plane. It has to be the the uh, has to be a sort of pure element, a wedge of things, and an arbitrary element in these. An arbitrary sum isn't a wedge of something. So, uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so you have the the Plucker relations, which you can sort of write out. You can take a a sort of seed multi-index with length um, less or equal to k minus two. You'll take um, another set of indices i one to i. Let's see, what is it? K minus one minus the length of i zero. Okay. Uh, J one to J K plus one minus length of I zero. Okay. And the, the Plucker relation is gonna be that zero is equal to the sum S equals one to K plus one minus I zero minus one to the S. I zero is n of I zero. Mm -hmm. What is I zero? I zero is a multi-index. No, no, the low, uh, lowercase i. Oh, l of i zero. Sorry. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, S equals one. Pi put i zero. I one. I. Uh, the last one. K minus one minus L of I zero. Okay, this is giving you something of length K minus one. So you want to add in another index and you take it from here. And then in this one, you just put in I zero as the starter and then remove JS, J K plus one minus L I zero. Okay, so that is the, these are, they're, quadratic relations, uh, you've got K indices here, K indices there, so everything works. Um, and of course, I'm taking all of these to be disjoint. Um, so these things come with a natural length, right? Um, so the length is just the number of monomials, the number of terms. And um, well, it it uh, lives in the interval um, three all the way up to I guess k plus one, depending on the the length of i zero. See, if you take i zero maximal length, then you've just got fewer terms here to sort of flip over. So if, if you take I zero length K minus two, then they're just three terms. Um, three terms is short. Um, and uh, these, these three term relations, quadratic, end up um, being used as recurrent relations used as recurrence. And um, these octahedral relations. And the basic idea is you, you sort of take the, the terms in one of these, these three term things and you, you sort of cleverly put them on a vertices of here an octahedron which will be the faces of a cube. You've got a lattice and you sort of propagate through the lattice with this thing, taking basically the five, five of the terms in this 
short relation as given, and then that will determine the the last one, and you sort of just move your cubes out into uh, space. So that's the the recurrence, and the idea is this is somehow a discrete version of the. Um, so your space is the lattice is z to the power of k. Sorry? So the, the space that you're moving in is the lattice n to the power of k, right? Yeah, or z to the power three here. But That's they just take the short ones. No, but okay, but it's embedded in z to the in n to the it'll be embedded into a bigger lattice, but we sort of get there eventually, yeah. But it's it's uh um and one of the sort of he thinks when you go back to the, the KP relation is you've got the Hirota relations, which have their protein. They have many, many shapes. Um, so I'm going to take the one that, uh, so this is, this is a, a Vandermoen determinant. Um, you're, you're, you're writing the uh, addition formula, not the Hirota, but it's a good one. Mm -hmm. You are writing the addition formula, not Hirota, but it's equivalent. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's why. Well, yes, that's that's why I always said it had many shapes, many lines. So this is this infinite dimensional vector of t's. This is the uh, sort of way of shorthand for uh, x one, x one squared over two, x one cubed over three, etc. Okay, and uh, that's the Vandermond. And so uh, if you write it out, you'll get uh, sum minus one to the J zeta. I should have a zeta N here, I suppose. Zeta N of T X one X N uh, Y J, so maybe a plus one. Um, Theta n plus one of t y one y j y n and all of this is supposed to be zero. Now, sort of look at the two, and it's it's an obvious parallel. And indeed, the 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 this, which is a sort of mild, mild modification of the tau function, gets used to sort of write out solutions. So that's the setup in, in uh, GLN or GL infinity, you've got finite dimensional Plucker relations that sort of mysteriously get transformed into Hirota relations in infinite dimensions. And these Hirota relations will enable you to, to solve these recurrences. So that's a, it's a scheme. Now it's kind of interesting. You see, this is these are relations for one, the coordinates of one plane. These, on the other hand, you're moving. And there's this sort of funny duality between looking at one Plucker coordinate uh, for a family of planes, right? Uh, which is what the tau function is, the basic Tucker coordinate, or looking uh, at all the Plucker coordinates of one plane. And that's a little sort of game that gets played in here, and it's, it's often just sort of swept under. These, the Hirota relations can sort of be used to develop the, the, the Plucker relations and things like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a sort of interesting little, little feature, but the aim of, of what I, we were doing is to see there's a BKP, which I won't talk about, and that's the orthogonal groups, but there's a CKP, which is for the sort of infinite dimensional uh, version. Uh, so one n tends to infinity of things associated to SPNC, um, there, is, there are finite dimensional um, recurrences, which are a little bit more mysterious. They're, they're quartic, um, 
they've got many terms. I was hoping to get here early enough to write them out on a board and sort of whip them out for you, but you may you might have to sit and and be patient instead. Um, the Keshe recurrences, and there's this sort of enrichment of this um, hexahedral, which is, is sort of comes up in work of Kenyon and P mantle. And so the question basically is, what is the geometry of all these? You've got this nice infinite dimensional geometry that sort of takes the finite dimensional stuff of Plucker coordinates and, and stretches it out into infinite dimensions. And so how does this, how does this work? Okay, so <clears throat> there's, there's a, a basic, there's a basic eraser that is needed. Uh, there's a, um, a basic uh, sort of element is, is what, what space are we working in? And of course, the, the uh, Grassmannians are sort of the basic homogeneous spaces, um, special cases of flag manifolds uh, for the, the A series groups. And if you go to the B or C series, you um, get, instead of just ordinary flags, you get isotropic flags. So spaces that are flags that are completely null with respect to the uh, symmetric form. Um, so here for the CKP, we're going to be looking at an, uh, an isotropic Lagrangian, and we're going to be looking at the the Lagrangian Grassmannian, which are the isotropic planes of maximal dimension. So um, maybe I'll just start with finite dimensions. Um, <clears throat> So the 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 uh, the space is the Lagrangian uh, Grassmannian. So, in other words, it's it's isotropic um, n planes in um, C two n, um, which you basically think of as a sum of two spaces. Vn plus Vn star. So um, C2n is going to be Vn plus V. Let's make a star. It's completely null. Completely null. Okay. Everything, any pair of vectors in this plane uh, paired to zero. Um, so you'll, we'll have bases E1. To En and E1 star to En star. And the basic, the, the only non zero, anything, all the Ens pair to zero, all the E stars pair to zero. And the only non zero relation is that Ei or pairing is the Ei Ej star is, of course, minus Ej star Ei. And it's the Kronecker delta. Okay, so just the the, the simplest possible uh, pairing. So that's uh, that's our space. And now, um, we have to think of it as sitting where. Okay, um, so we we had that the ordinary Grossman was sitting in the nth exterior power would have been C two n here. Um, SPN is, is a smaller group than GL2N. And wedge N of C2N is not irreducible for SPN. So there, there's so it's be sitting in one of the irreducible components of wedge N C2N. So it's sitting inside. Um, I'll just write wedge N N of well say C2N. So this is sitting inside wedge N of C2N. And what is this? It's the, the, uh, the planes that are killed by the symplectic form, because you've got a, a skewed form. It's defined by, by this. So in other words, it's the, um, the set of omegas such that, so living here, 
but such that omega wedge some EI wedge EI star. Okay, so they're, in other words, they're n vectors. You wedge it, you get an n plus two vector. It's got to be zero. That's the symplectic form. That's the symplectic form, right? <clears throat> so um, now uh, this has an interesting subspace, which is not a. Yeah, the yeah. Not no, this is the set. These are an, this is an n form or an n vector. And you wedge it with this. Yeah, this is an implicit isomorphism between the space and the dual. So it's really a exterior two. Yeah. Anyway, so um, there's going to be a oh yeah, I've used the letter V too many times. So I'll put it, call it W. So an interesting space W sitting inside here. Should I call it W? I'll ask John. What? Are you still w. awake? Good. Don't use W, use little W. Use little W. No, no, I'm the subspace. What should I use? Oh, well, we called it, uh, I think, lambda n zero, but you can call it anything you like. Okay. Well, the subspace of that. No, I, yeah. You want the image of what? The, the, the of principal the minor space. What do, you, what do you want to call it? Okay, I'll, I'll stick with W then. Okay. Um, and um, so what does this look like? Well, um, Remember that in wedge N of CN, C2N, the Plucker coordinates, um, minors of, um, and it should be the sort of N by N minors, right? So you take the, the, an N by N matrix in that and you, you take its, its determinant. Um, so you, the, you want a combination of these, so you write out a vector, it'll be these co have these coefficients given by the minors. And um, well, what's the, the isotropic condition? Iso isotropy condition. This is for an arbitrary plane. Um, if you, it works out very simply, it's just A is symmetric. So that's very nice. Um, in this setup, you've got um, right. You, you've got n n rows here to choose. Choose some here. Choose some there. Um, and the ones you want for your subspace W will be obtained by choosing a principal minor up here and taking the complementary thing downstairs. So. Um, W will be the principal minors. Now, not of length n, because you're choosing the complementary set from this identity matrix of A. And um, with the correspondence, because the other one's just acting, it's just giving you a determinant that's one up to a sign. And so it'll just be the principal minor space. Okay, so that's there's this funny little space here. It's not. Um, it's not uh, an irreducible representation or anything. That that's this thing, but it's it's sitting there, and it's sort of useful. Okay. Um, Maybe I could add a comment which could not go as far as what you're picking out as W uh, is the subspace of that irreducible S P module. Which in suitably uh, ordered basis in a sense corresponds to symmetric partitions. Symmetric partition, as, as everyone knows, or at least you've heard Alex describe, are those with pairs of Frobenius indices are identical. Okay? And so you really only have one set of strictly ordered integers. And that is what labels the uh, W. So if you tell about the dimension, well, they will tell you the dimension. But so that, that, that's not all the different coordinates. It's the subset corresponding to symmetric partitions. Mm -hmm. okay. Good, thank you, sir. So in any case, my, my Lagrangian grass manual will be sitting in here embedded. And you can just sort of project backwards here. 
it will project with a, a sort of multi to one to this space. Um, <clears throat> so there's there's a just a second. You, w is the collection of the principal minors. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. So, or, or, I mean, there's still relations. It satisfies over here, and that's that's precisely where these Kashaya things are going to come in. But anyway, so that's the no, no, just, just the terminology here. Is, yeah. it, is W a collection of spaces? Is W a collection? W of uh, the 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 uh, if you want, if you write out omega to be some uh, things in here, right? You just think of it as sitting in here, F I E I, satisfying this relation. Then, uh, and now the, the multi indices, remember, they can either be starred or unstarred. So, you know, it'll be a sequence of it's, uh, there'll be starred things and unstarred things in there. Um, and here uh, will just be the multi indices corresponding to the principal minors of, uh, of, uh, a, so it'll be, in other words, a uh, writing it out, um, writing basis elements here, you'll get things like EI1, IK, and then um, in the complementary set of indices, um, so you, you, in other words, you're taking the, 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 um, Set of indices and and indices which are which are either starred or unstarred, and in terms of their sort of enumeration one to n, the the unstarred ones and the starred ones, if you put them together, give you all the numbers from one to n. But the set of indices here and the set of, is disjoint. Okay, I'll be writing it out later in for for three planes because that's the sort of the key case. Basically. It's a linear subspace. It's a linear subspace. And those are the symmetric. Um, okay, so they're they're sitting in this this uh, space. Um, so the relations. Remember, you still have you still have the plucker. And you have also the linear relation, which given by some EI, which EI star equals zero. I think that gives you a linear relation on the coordinates. Quadratic, linear. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to do an example, um, which is uh, isotropic three planes in um, in uh, C six, okay. So um, so the the uh, the W coordinates, if you want. So in other words, I'm going to take an element um, of wedge three of C six. I'm going to write it say as F one two three E one wedge E two wedge E three plus F1 star, two star, three star, E1 star wedge, E2 star wedge, E3 star, and so on, right? So I've got the indices are either starred or unstarred, and the, the uh, um, you write out an arbitrary element. Okay, so what is the, the uh, the W coordinates, if you want. So the things corresponding to things living in here um, are um, F123. So I just got unstarred F1 star, two star, three star. But I've got each, each index appearing um, F1, two star, three star plus cyclic, um, F one, two, three star plus cyclic, with the obvious convention that it, you know, you, when you put things in order, you have to sort of change signs and things. Okay, so you've got, you've got three of them here, you've got three of them here, 
you've got one there and one there. So you've got something that's eight dimension. Uh, the non W coordinates, well, you'll get things like F1, I don't know, two, two star, F1, three, three star. So you get repeat repetitions in the indexes, indices. Okay. And um, so you're in, in six dimensions. So you'll have uh, the short pluckers, three, three, three terms. You'll have pluckers of length four, and that's it. Okay. Um, and you have the linear constraint, um, which tells you things like F1, two, two star is minus F1, three, three star, et cetera. Okay, so the, these, these get reduced somewhat. This is, I think, a 14 dimensional representation. So you get sort of six, once you put in your constraints, you get six, six things. Yeah. And uh, so what do you do? Uh, you take the, the, um, take the plucker um, with the linear constraints, um, square, you know, combine. So it's, it's nothing, nothing terribly deep, but what you do is you eliminate the non-W coordinates. Okay, so you just get it into this 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 space here, um, and you get basically the Kashaev recurrence. Um, and because I think, in interest of time, rather than so, in other words, the Kashaev relation is basically just a combination of Plucker relations plus the the constraint of isotropy. So I'm just going to say get Keshaya because I'm a bit short on time. Can you just write it up in general strength? Well, okay. Uh, pi one, two, three squared pi one star, two star, three star squared plus pi one, two, three star squared pi one star two star three squared plus cyclic and, and one two three so there are three terms here um is equal to two pi one two three pi one star two star three star pi one two three star Yes, I'm trying to make him happy, but it's 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 hard. The norm in the 19th century as the hyperdeterminate relation would be z2 cross z2 plus z2 type, and I think they would have put this down by Okay. Are the relations satisfied by the principal minors of any symmetric matrix? Okay. So those are the Kishaya relations, which need obviously to be written out. Um, the hexahedron re relations actually just involve the uh, the non W hexahedron uh, relations uh, involve the uh, non W if you want coordinates. But again, it's Plucker plus plus isotropy. So you're getting these relations. The the um, the isotropy is um, sorry the the uh, the hexahedron these the Kashaya relation you're in an eight dimensional space you've got one relation but you've got the projective relation too so you're getting something six dimensional once you impose this constraint and indeed the uh, Lagrangian isotropic space is is six dimensional so it's it's actually cutting things out it's 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 an image of a projection of the embedding from wedge and n. So it's it's several to one, but it's it's basically cutting it out. The hexahedron are living in wedge and n plus the Kashaev, and there it's it's cutting things out. Okay, so um what's the the uh the sort of moral? You've got these relations, 
they're there on isotropic three planes and six space. Uh, by this sort of trick of adding in a seed generator, you can sort of shift them up and down, but they're, they're essentially for these sort of three term relations on the general isotropic spaces and four terms. So how would you see that uh, you want a theorem that says the short implies long, right? Because these things still come with a, with a, a Plucker relation. Remember, the sort of three and four flukers give you the, the Kishaya. Well, I mean, just gonna, I will ask a question. So, um, I mean, the, the, Plucker, the Plucker relation, the ideal generated by Plucker relation, that's out exactly what it's planning, right? Yeah. Uh, is, are these enough to cut out exactly the isotropic personality? Up to, up to finite ambiguity. <laughs> well, yeah, square roots. You are I mean, being ambiguous. Yeah, but yes, yes. Yeah, it's finitely it's ambiguous. Yes, yes. which is better than usual. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not one to one. It's not an embedding. It's it's embedding by a quotient by a reflection. It's the embedding of the quotient of the isotropic and so it's actually an orbital. It's not a one to one. Anyway, so, so to see that short implies long, there's there's various things. There's this result of earning that does it for principal um, matrices. It's a little bit clear, unclear there because it's, it's saying basically the the uh, the principal determinants. Once you impose all possible uh, three term or Kishayev, uh relations on them, that it cuts out the full the full space. It only cuts it out set theoretically. So there's a multiplicity, but there's a nice, I like it anyway, a uh, geometric way of seeing this, which is that the following thing, if you just think of it, an N space sitting in CN, okay, that's isotropic. Um, C2N. Hmm? C2N, sorry, thank you. Um, you can intersect it with say the set where the, the first coordinate vanishes in C2N. And you'll get a, I don't know, let's call it D hat N, an N minus one space. I intersect it out and then because it's, it's uh, you know, I want something isotropic, I want, uh, I'll project out, so project out F1. Okay, so intersection projection. It's a symplectic thing, right? So symplectic reduction, intersect, project, et cetera. Okay, so uh, do the same thing here. Intersection of F1 equals zero, pi F1 star. Okay, so you project out the other one. So you get another isotropic plane. It's not the same one. You can take the intersection of both and get something isotropic here. So what's the analog of this on forms? Okay, on forms, intersection is just the contraction. Um, and projection is just projecting out the coordinate, set coordinate to zero. Okay, so do that on a form. So you start out in sort of parallel with a form up here. And you'll get sort of things here. Now, the result is basically that if these, if these correspond to isotropic planes, in other words, they satisfy the Plucker, um, plus coherence, projecting out not just the first coordinate, but all of them, so doing this for each one of them, then uh, this one is implies omega is also satisfies the Plucker plus isotropic. Okay, so in other words, you you restrict the planes, you make sure that they the results match in the way that is given by this the thing that you want, and then the result is you can sort of glue everything together and get a a thing. Now this is dropping one dimension. The point is you can drop all your way down to three dimensions in six spaces. So you've got a huge sort of lattice of ways of doing it. Now, what happens is that the, the Plucker coordinates, basically under these operations, the Plucker coordinates, the Plucker relations that survive are the short ones. 
The others die, they disappear. So in other words, under these restrictions, you, you get down to something that it just has the, the requisite Booker relations in, in three, six dimensions. And you've seen that they sort of, the results fit together back into some global thing. You also see, by the way, what the, the genericity results you need is that these operations of contraction actually have to give you non-zero results. So as long as you have transversality, the thing works, it works without multiplicities and it gives you the, uh, the short implies long in this thing. Now, we already saw the shortest ones gave you the Kashaya and the hexahedron up to this finite ambiguity. In other words, if you've got all possible sort of for these, these projections and things, you've got all possible Kishayev relations, then the result is something isotropic. So viewed from the point of the recurrence, this sort of three term is coherent with the extra recurrences you could go off by branching in other, other directions, which is a sort of useful thing. Okay. Um, okay, so what's the... the um, in infinite dimensions now. So I'll have to be a little bit briefer. Um, so basically you're, you're in with the, the isotropic, um, still with the, the, uh, the uh, same Hilbert space. You've got a skew form, which takes two functions and takes the residue of the product of f of z, and the way you make it skew is you just put g of minus z here. Um, and so you get a the infinite Grassmannian isotropic, sort of gr, say, Lagrangian uh, infinity, sitting inside the standard one. So just basically in the same way, you just ask that the things be isotropic. Um, the group gamma, you get a subgroup, gamma zero. Um, and uh, it'll just be the set of gamma t's. But now where all the even t's are set to zero. So it will be the e to the sum over i um, t. 2i minus 1, z to the 2i minus 1. Okay. Now, why does this preserve the, the, uh, the symplectic form? Um, so if you're starting out with something null, the, the easiest way is just to do the sort of Lee theory, you know, the, 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 not the calculation for the group, or the Lie algebra. And it's basically just the, the fact that if you, um, have f of z, the residue of f of z and g minus of z is zero. If I'm taking the residue of z to the 2i minus 1, f of z, g of z, plus f of z minus z to the 2i minus 1, g of minus z. That's also zero. Okay, so it's it's uh, on the level of the algebra, so it amounts to that, and then so this group preserves the uh, thing. So you've just got these uh, things, the same tau function, just restricted. Um, algebraically, it's kind of amusing. You get algebraic curves that have an involution, and instead of looking at the, um, sorry, you, instead of looking at the Jacobian. Uh, you just take flows basically along a, a suitable prim variety. So it's, it's a, but it fits, it's coherent with this, this picture on the, on the uh, with gamma. Um, so just finish with the discrete flows here. I, I think credit, a lot of credit is due to uh, Semyon who really sort of wrote this out, out in a beautiful way, which is that, um, You basically take the tau function, you shift it, but you have to put in these sort of corrective factors. Um, so I'll just write out the one. So I'm gonna choose 
uh, my ingredients are what discrete shifts um, xi and yi using the, or just yi actually. Um, I'm taking the flows just to be the odd ones. In other words, only the, the corresponding to this, the gamma zero up there. Um, I define a sort of shifted functions like this, yi minus yj, um, ni minus one, ni plus ni, and i minus j, or minus j, sorry. Um, product to infinity, ij equals one. I'll just finish this, writing this out in, in minus i. I must improve my handwriting. Um, yeah, if he's doing that, I'll say comment with what he's doing. He, he eval just like in the KP case, he's evaluating the tau with some normalization, which is wise. He's evaluating it on an infinite lattice. So it's especially values. It's not the uh, flipper coordinates, it's the values of the tau. But Mirab needs to, he would show that they satisfy the same articulations as those Gashaya and the Hexahedron related that the that flipper coordinates. Okay. There we go. So we, we're shifting by sort of y and minus y. So that sort of keeps us in this this uh, T prime thing. Um, we've got all these corrective factors here. And the way uh, basically Semyon phrased it is it's, it's, this allows you to define a morphism from the, the ring of the infinite Grassmannian. Um, so um, to um, the ring, corresponding to basically Z uh, infinity. So it's, it, these are infinite dimensional rings. And this formulation has a great virtue of, of giving you, you know, you've got tau functions that are formal series works here. Uh, you've got all sorts of things. So it, it's, it's a very clever way of saying it. And it has hidden in it this precisely this duality that, that John just mentioned, which is that, okay, we're flowing on the Grassmannian, but what this is saying basically is that we're getting the relations for a point. So it's, it's, it's kind of odd, really. Um, but that is what the discrete flow is. Cause you know, you, on the maps on the rings, you, you sort of turn it this way. If you're thinking of it as maps of points, things flip around. And so we've got this infinite dimensional lattice. Um, <clears throat> and it's obviously just these shifts so if you want on the Grassmannian, the shifts are nice. It's a group action. On the lifting to actual functions, you've got all these weird corrective factors that come in as little twists and things. So it's not, it doesn't lift to, to a group action because of these, these correction factors. And that, well, sort of, I think it's time you had a break. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, are there questions? Main question. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. So you also refer to the work by uh, in, uh, Yeah. And uh, and they have this tau function, which is the square root of this. I was scared that you'd ask us about that. We have no idea what the hell. So it's, no, it's, it is no geometric meaning. But no, we sort of what you see. The trouble is, of course, you keep thinking, oh damn, spinners. Oh no doesn't work because there are no spinners for the symplectic group, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, you'd have this square root, everything would fit nicely and nah. <laughs> so there, there's no, there's, it's, it's just sitting there. Now maybe there's some infinite dimensional artifact where somehow, you know, spin and SO are the same, or I don't know. Even if you look at the solution, right? In the polynomial solution, that's all right? Then you see that uh, the polynomial is definitely not a square. So if you take yeah. the square root, you get something. Yeah. So we get to that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I I no idea. Yeah. So uh, that I could add, could I say yeah. something? Sure. Um, we did we didn't use the square root, and we think that's 
funky. Like it, it's not an accurate belief. Uh, but a very nice criterion of picture where in the road, and they gave it the question is which KP telephones are secret or, or give you the secret. And they they're okay, they're, they're various, and you know that they're various winter criteria for saying, okay, here's the CK telephone thing. When is when is it? Uh, case of when is it CCP? In particular, you only look at the odd flow of that. Again, that doesn't make it CCP. Um, and they gave a very nice critical point right here, which was that actually all they gave was that the derivative of the tau function, of the KP tau function, with respect to the even flow variables at the points where they vanish, vanishes. So it's a sort of critical point condition. And that can very easily be translated into linear conditions, additional linear conditions on the Fricker point. That we did. So the picture is brought in. Yeah, but it right simply means that you have this evolution which says the, the even tau t to minus one. And then the, yeah, and then the same okay, thing, that's right? also coming. So there are so at least two or three very easy ways to say what a tau function of a capable function yeah, yeah. satisfies. Uh, and each of those can be put into a form which is either chaotic or in terms of the of, of further linear constraints on the flipper coordinates. And we did all that. But, mm -hmm. So there are a whole, a whole bunch of equivalent criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, but the square root business seems that yeah. it's in it's fiction. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't okay. exist. <laughs> Sorry, Alberto. Yeah. I mean, since you're talking of square roots, go back just KDB. Are there any tau functions for the master symmetries of KDB? What you have a class of rational solutions of the master symmetries of KDB. Mm -hmm. You may call them with other names. The solo flows, second <laughs> non structure, that, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In that case, for, for a family of those, in the vehicle with Boltzmann, we do have for are in practice the tau functions. I mean, mm -hmm. by the potential as the second derivative of the law of that thing. But they must be a special case <clears throat> of some something. So for KDB it's clear, right? Because this is what if you change the times there, because this is what Alexander said, he shows that KDB belongs to PKB and PKB is the square root of KDB. Yeah, but the talking of the master scene. Okay. Yeah, uh, the W, W. Yeah, maybe that's what So those are the extra symmetries of oil yeah. and yeah. Okay. Okay. So it, as far as I know, th those are very important, but uh, they, they do not uh, lead uh, to, uh, to erotified by linear equations. They are symmetries of the, of the erotified equations, but they are not themselves as a dynamical system expressible in terms of, you know, as far as I know. But they are very important in another sense. That's a big, still open question, which we discussed. So my, my question is really uh, the tau functions that we have in the, world, in the sense that they do for the for tau functions are supposed to do, and give you the potential to the right things in the short way. They could be characters, some representations, or who knows what, maybe the W start. Mm -hmm. all, all that is true. But the role of the W's or the extra symmetries, mm -hmm. the, they are very important. And uh, there's some work to be done by your students. Uh, there's an unproved theorem of which there are many examples. They, um, if you look at their critical points, look at the points where they vanish, those mechanisms vanish, that each time they get a critical point. It gives you for the Baker, you know, the associated Baker function, a uh, differential equation in the spectral parameters. So you don't just have the KP or the KP or CKP flows, but as already pointed out in the original work of Jim Hall and company, uh, they preserve uh, the monotony of, it's very often a rational system, but the monotony of that equation linear equation in the spectral parameter. And uh, that is roughly speaking, just a uh, uh, 
uh, uh, scaling, scaling reduction. So they play the role of scaling reduction or Vera Soro reduction or WLD reduction. They're all reductions which give you a smaller manifold which is invariant. And uh, they turn out to be exactly, at least in many cases, to be exactly the familiar isomonogonic systems that are studied on their own merits. But nobody has, for instance, ever, I know, ever derived all the kind of equations to be found that way. Uh, well, not all. Uh, yes, all, all the kind of equations if you go to multi component KD. But the Schlesinger equations, which are the example <laughs> par excellence of Fuchsian uh, isomorphic integrations, nobody has ever derived it as an uh, extra symmetry reduction of the KP or multi KP. It probably is true. Give it your I mean, you cover so much that there are one or two words that are direct in front of you with this. They, they suddenly come from the vice vector problem. That's exactly what they are. Yeah. Have these, these start functions that we're trying to sell. Yeah. Suddenly, appear. speaking of selling it, all the formula come from this excellent book <laughs> that is on sale outside on the front. Yeah. That's exactly what they are. And they have isomonogamy problems. But they, they are, they're all written down. It's a question of identifying them as a special case, some, something else. You, so you're saying that the bispectral. Bispectral uh, problem has two family of large solutions. One has to do with rational solutions, KDD, yeah. and then you find the usual power function. And then there are the rational solutions of the master symmetries, for which we have the tau function. Special case of some depends what you mean by tau. Depends what you mean by tau function. You can have something that functions that depend on what I told you. I told you what I mean that I can write the potential as the second derivative, the law of that. Okay, in that sense, they call that a tau function. Bertrand has a broader definition, everyone has a slightly different definition. I stick with the Kyoto school. So for me, a tau function is what they define. And there are two types of theory that they overlap. One is isomonodromic, the other is isospectral. And they all satisfy the Rhoda bilinear equation. If they don't do that, they're not a tau function. They're, they're not a tau function. That's, that's a good suggestion. I mean, <laughs> dark and dark in the back. Yeah. <laughs> It's, and if it's broken, you can always use dark data. <laughs> Any further question, comments? No. <laughs> <laughs>